Hi, I'm David Marsh, and welcome to Exploring the Human Journey. Exploring the Human Journey. Hi, I am so glad you joined us today. I have the number one Amazon international best-selling author, Robert Trembley, on set today. We're gonna have a great conversation. Recently, I got a chance to spend some time with him, and I want you to watch this great video. Five years ago, almost to the day, I was actually in hospice. It's not easy every day to live with AIDS. You know, writing the book 20 Seconds and now the new book uh, coming out, uh, Dying for Forgiveness, has been a struggle for me to find the courage to actually publish this next book and, and talk about the things we talk about. And uh, for me, is trying to find that piece of, of giving back to the world. So within a year of our book 20 Seconds being published, it became an international bestseller and stayed there for 59 weeks. So we're just ecstatic, but the real intent of our story was to begin a charity uh, called Gab Inc., short for Give a Buck. Uh, through Tremor Books, 20 Seconds, and Dying for Forgiveness, and any book we publish, we will contribute a dollar to Give a Buck uh, for charity for HIV advocation and awareness. We've done some crazy, amazing things uh, legislative uh, recently with, with our story and our platform of people. Um, and just like my survival, the whole thing really came down to what we were able to accomplish legislatively and even on the bestseller list was down to a collective or a community of people. Uh, this year, our law being being put through the, the trials of the state house in Arizona is the first state ever to pass this type of legislation that will give every patient who has a blood drawn in the state of Arizona the right to have it screened for HIV and Hep C. No risk factors, no discussions about why. Just that's your right. It's called why you're there. Uh, so while you're there in my blood, would you go ahead and just <laughs> test it for a communicable disease that I could be passing on in my life? And I take responsibility for what I'm putting out to this world, just like I try to do every single day. Absolutely anything is possible. Awesome. Dude, anything is possible. It's crazy. It's uh, the the entire six years just seems. I, I keep laughing. Carol and I talk all the time. It just just when you think you've seen it all, you know what I mean. Yeah. Something comes along, and you know, it, my disease being caught so late, Dave, put us in a in a position of of not just wanting to scream about get tested. If I had just gotten tested. Yeah. Um, the, the, the reality of some things I, I didn't talk about in my book and I'm talking about in the next book is what it's really like to live with end-stage AIDS, mm -hmm. uh, not being in the quote-unquote risk factors according to the CDC. I just wasn't tested. And, uh, you know, it's certainly a lesson for many people with with what's happening today with that disease. So yep. it's, um, yeah. So you've been living for six years ish yeah. with end stage AIDS, yeah. man. Yeah. That's intense. Uh, your book, 20 Seconds. This is a great book. It's a great read. Uh, definitely need to pick that up. In that book, you kind of detail the events that happened, the things you had to go through. You had a near-death experience. Right. Uh, that That's kind of near and dear to my heart because that's what kind of set me free from the construct of a fear-based religion, that it's a one and done and then the right. judgment. And you had an experience where you went to the other side and you saw and felt and heard things that were <clears throat> out of the ordinary and you felt this peace and this love. Yeah. For the folks that haven't heard your story, kind of just give us a, a small brief version of that. Yeah, I mean, I had been diagnosed uh, terminal, of course, and uh, when I had my experience, it, it was just not anything in my wheelhouse of, of believability. I, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if I didn't have time or, or the patience or, or what it was, but it just wasn't something that it would have, I, I didn't recognize it for what it was. Mm -hmm. I was in a, 
basic, basically a comatose state in an intensive care unit. I had signed a do not resuscitate. Wow. So, so you were I like, was done. Good. It was, I was at peace with my decision. Mm -hmm. I was surrounded with family. Um, and I waited for the inevitable. Yeah. And Did you expect just lights out? I don't know what I expected. I was, I was scared. Mm. I mean, it was realer than real. And, uh, and so you and, knew death was a reality, but you you didn't really have an idea what was going to happen. You know, when I was first diagnosed, I, I think there was a certain there wasn't a certain there was an absolute definitive amount of shame mm. in my story. Wow. I was a, a married heterosexual male. Uh, being told in, in a hospital in North Carolina, you have six weeks to live. Yeah. Uh, bleeding lesions all over my legs. I, I could barely keep my head up. And, and the first thing in being told, Dave, that I'm terminal with a dot with a disease is, but I'm not gay. I'm, I, uh, it's because we always frame it around the, it's a gay disease. I mean, and, talk about the example yeah. of this whole story was, you know, today we're finding that 47% of all HIV population are actually females ages 13 to 24 years of age and in prime childbearing years. Yep. And we're not talking about yep. that. Today. The stigma it's, is not in a specific community. It's, it's it, general. It needs yeah. to be. And that's yeah. where we went wrong 35 years ago. Yeah. And, and, you know, we need to be able to forgive us ourselves for what we didn't know. Uh, but I mean, the, one of the other fastest growing populations now are senior citizens. Mm, um, talk about just, you know, that was an era that didn't get the education that, mm -hmm. uh, that some of us got. And uh, this is a real deal. This is a real thing. Mm -hmm. and after 35 years and 36 million dead, uh, it, it's beyond time to have a, mm -hmm. a, an open dialogue. But it's still a, an awkward conversation to have. Yep. But, uh, um, I've lost as many as I've gained mm -hmm. in, in standing up and telling my story. And, uh, you know, for, for us, one of the, the, the amazing things is, is I'm not an expert at a near death experience. I'm not an expert at dying. I just, I told my story because there were medical anomalies in my story that made no sense yeah. to medical science. And I think those are the, the, the examples that we need to pay attention yep. to in life. The, the holy cow moments of, you know, we keep seeing all these miracle stories, these instant remissions and the Anita Morhani stories yep. and uh, uh, Jeff Olson is surviving these traumatic accidents. And, but, you know, my story comes along and, and just bugs just disturbs medical science because they, yep. I think more often than not those miracles we keep hearing about they keep saying oh boy that immune system you just you just don't know yeah it's amazing what the immune system the the things we don't know about the immune system and then I come along without an immune system <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so you're in a hospice situation you you die you have an encounter you come back and then how how is your immune system at, at that point you probably didn't have one that, yeah, I basically had zero. Yeah. Um, it's it's judged in, in in determination of your T cells. So a normal person has about fifteen hundred T cells, is what the numbers would be. I, when I was diagnosed, I had one. Oh. <laughs> so what'd you call him? Brutus. We, we gave him a name. We, Brutus the T cell. Boy, he needed friends, and uh, <laughs> he needs some friends. We we talked every day with Brutus about uh, learning to get along yeah. and, and get along we, with others. We, you know, the community thing became a clear aspect you since, find a girlfriend. since my experience but <laughs> yes. you know honestly this whole experience laying in a hospital bed i uh, when i came to from this experience i i immediately labeled it as a dream mm. um, although so vivid and so clear and so impactful yeah. it just i literally changed almost instantly i could i could barely walk yeah and then literally you know 10 minutes after my dream i got out of bed and and walked down to the nurse's station, demanded to see all my doctors. Yeah, and, you uh, called like a board meeting. Didn't oh you? yeah, I, I got to see him. There's something important I'm supposed to do. Yeah. And, and that was the deal. This this man in this snapping, spinning ball of pure white energetic light of the utmost peaceful experience of my entire existence. And 
we spoke to each other. He said there was something important I'm supposed to do. And I traveled back out of my body, back to my body. I woke up and said, there's something important I'm supposed to do. <laughs> really well, I don't know what the hell it is, yeah. but I, yeah. you know, I literally snapped the covers back and marched down and said, I need to see all my doctors right now. Yeah. And because you didn't uh, know how much longer you had to do the thing you were supposed well, to do. Well, <laughs> and you know, that's, it's a very important thing that you bring up. It, I still don't know. Yeah, I still try to you figure know, it out. Six years later, yeah. and uh, even the Mayo Clinic is, I, I wheel in there once a year for my normal stuff. And, you know, I, there's always three or four doctors waiting, you know, and they're always surprised when you walk through the door. Wow. I think they're waiting, you know. Um, they tell me most people with end stage AIDS never have lasted more than three years. So Incredible. It um, so they poke and prod and want to know what you do differently, and uh, yeah. and and I don't do anything really differently. I didn't. There was there were not tremendous, massive lifestyle changes. There were massive changes in how I perceive the world, what I do for the world, what I give back to the world, and and. And the amount of gratitude every day. I mean, I maybe I cheat. You know, how hard is it to find gratitude every single day, Dave, yeah. when the you know the first sun hits your face? Mm. You know that that warmth and it just it's like rain. Yeah. And you just look up and say, "Holy cow!" <laughs> Five years ago, I was in hospice. Yeah. You know, just I remember signing getting an ID card, and I mean, it's just a formal, you know. I, I remember choosing gravestones mm. out of a pile of, you know, how do you, do you even, how do you even explain that to mm. somebody, what it's like to stand in front of a pile of granite and choose your headstone? Wow. Yeah, most people don't think about that. Yeah. And they just assume someone yeah. else will take care of that. But you had to be confronted with your mortality. Still got that son of a bitch. Oh, <laughs> That's, oh, that's intense, man. Wow. So where do you keep that at? <laughs> I keep that back in Vermont. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be my final. That's still home to me. Yeah. yeah. Well, you have, uh, you have gone through this journey. You've worked on your book and you've told your story. You've done seminars. You've done conferences. Yeah. You've also written a second book called Dying for Forgiveness that's going to be out soon, probably going to be out at, after the show, the show is released. Yeah. So yeah. tell me about that journey. Yeah, this has been the toughest one, uh, maybe the toughest thing I'll ever write. It, uh, I had such high expectations for, for 20 seconds when it came out, and it hit every goal that I set for itself in the bestseller category. and. Uh, book of the year, book of the month, and I mean, we've had such great success, and and most all of the proceeds go to the, to the charity as well. Uh, but when I sat down to tell the story of, because again, my system didn't just recover; I didn't just wake up and start running marathons, and it, it's an everyday medical thing because I was caught late. Um, you know, every couple of months something comes along. I've worked six years to be able to proudly say I have one quarter of your immune system. Wow. So for all intents and purposes, my doctors are still, boy, you shouldn't be within six feet of people. Mm. And, and you know, the boy in the bubble kind of philosophy mm -hmm. that, uh, um, and I travel around the world telling my story yeah. to, to clarify to that whoever should, I can. You shouldn't be next to people, not because of what you have, but because of what they have yeah. that you might get. Yeah. Because yeah. so many people think there's this stigma with the disease. Right. Yeah. And, and that was the irony of the, the first person I ever told uh, after my diagnosis, and I was dying, and I told them, and great friends, and uh, they literally picked up their baby and said, how dare you? Oh, wow. Uh, put my child at risk. And no idea. Mm -hmm. uh, that is so great point. It's There are still people out there who have absolutely no idea yeah. that, uh, for me, as your example points out, it's, it, it is a thousand times more dangerous for me to be sitting with people than, than vice versa. There's yeah. no way to catch the disease other than bloodborne transformation. So. Yeah. Uh, still a lot of work to do, yeah. and uh, there's still a lot of stigma associated with it, and 
And that's the thing that, I, I, you know, I, the vulnerability of this book and telling this tremendous story isn't just the miraculous part of how do you heal without an immune system. Uh, it was really, and I, I try not to take a ton of positions in this book, but the one thing I'm very clear about in, in my experience and, and sense and my continued survival with a core of the immune system, that it was never about me being a hero. But I was surrounded by them, yeah. the hundreds, yeah. and they came exactly at the right time, manner, and sequence that I needed to continue to move forward one day at a time, sometimes hourly. I mean, I was sicker than most human beings could even possibly understand. When you have no functioning immune system, you could get wiped out by a bug on a Walmart shopping cart mm. like that. Yeah. And it's a still a continual concern with a quarter of an immune system, but we don't live that way. We live in a state of constant grace the best we can. Um, and, and we tell our story about vulnerability and a oneness that we were certain had a great deal to do with our survival. Mm -hmm. Certainly our success. Um, and I think our continual evolution as a species. Mm -hmm. We're in a divisive time politics yeah. and things are going goofy yeah. i mean you turn on the tv and you you think you lost your freaking mind yeah. um, we are led bred and fed divisive yeah. and so many people like me have these transformative experiences and come back talking about the same things mm -hmm. oneness yeah. this oneness yeah. this we're all connected and every push is a shove and every breath into the world a butterfly's wing that will have an effect and and taking responsibility for it right yep. you know can Isn't we it do that interesting how there's so much separation and so much other and you know let's mm. let's make us great and keep the other away and there's so much you know let's let's define a border yeah. so we keep the other out but yet the reality is unity that there is no other in that spiritual sense there has never been Social change, social evolution, there has never been anything incrementally positive for our society or our world without a collective unity yeah. pulling the strings. Yeah. But yet we're still back there behind the curtain some days trying to decide what side, what, 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 I want to belong to something. Yep. Um, and, and now it's, you know, it's not the human race anymore you belong to. Mm -hmm. It's it's what separates us in that human race yeah. now. Is one better than another? And there's a constant competitive edge and yeah, we're back to you know tribalism, back to the caveman it, mentality. It, we are devolving. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. as a as a species. And uh, and, and don't think that 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 some of these leaders don't understand how it works. Mm -hmm. This is how we divide them and conquer them, and 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 we need to to wake up to mm -hmm. some things. And I think, uh, you know, I'm fascinated with a recent survey that uh, last year was taken, and it said that 54 percent of the American population has now had some sort of spiritually transformative event. Now, mm. you know, 10, 15 years ago, that number was not, yep. you know, was minute. We were, a, we were a quiet hush in the corner. Sure. Us, you know, the, the crazy, the misfits, the, the uh, square pegs and the round holes. Yeah. And uh, you didn't need to hand out daisies at the airport to understand <laughs> spirituality that yeah. you can be decent to other human beings and have your life turn out to be pretty decent because of it. And it just seemed a little simple to me that uh, we're all in a pretty big hurry. And uh, so this definitely was an event in my life that slowed me down because I, you know, one of the remarkable parts of my story was and I don't know if I can do this on the air, Dave, so I apologize. This is <laughs> what a remarkable asshole I was yeah. prior to my experience yeah. to maybe I'm still an asshole in some aspects of my life, but I live a different life mm -hmm. and it is in service to others. Mm -hmm. um, it is trying to help as many as I can, as long as I can, as hard as I can every single day. And maybe I'm a selfish guy, but I think it keeps me alive. Mm -hmm. You know, my favorite Robert Trembling quote is, 
people ask you how you got your disease mm. and you tell them it's because maybe you were accused of loving too much. Yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes that, you know, if somebody's really, and you can tell when people are awkward. Oh, about Leo, it. the dog is fired up about something. He does that every now and then. <laughs> no, it's a good topic to talk about because there are people who will, it may be one of the only diseases, you know, because if you tell somebody I've got cancer, they don't go, Oh, how'd you get that? Dude? Yeah. Yeah, nobody gives a shit. I mean, you know, come <laughs> That's on. That's right. But you tell somebody you have HIV or AIDS, and, and yeah. it, I'm not even sure if it's a knee jerk. Oh, how'd you get that? Really? Now yeah. I want to know everything about your sex life. And there are occasional people, and you have to know who you can get away with it with. When I'll pull them aside and say, let me tell you exactly how it happened. <laughs> and I'll move in, and I'll put my hand on them, and, and you watch, and a little uncomfortable, this will start happening. It, yeah, it, and then there are some people I just say, you know what? I love too much. I love too freely. And... Uh, you know, maybe they're all rationalizations too. I, I made poor choices. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, you know, I, I need to be okay with that and be forgiving of myself. Mm -hmm. And I think that is probably bar none. Mm -hmm. the, the biggest aspect of my experience yeah. was understanding that I needed to forgive myself. Yeah. And, and we all fall. We all step on something and trip and, um, but we all don't get up the same. Yeah. And and people could learn from my mistake here. Yeah. And it, it isn't just a holy cow every once in a while. It's a 36-year-old disease that's still spiraling out of control mm -hmm. after that long because of the fact we can't have an honest conversation yeah. without, well, without people going, oh, that's awkward. Right. It, and it's it, about it isn't. the testing. So when I go to a clinic to have a mm. blood draw, uh, nowhere in there does it say, do you want to have an AIDS test? No. And if I do say, hey, I'd like to have an AIDS test, yeah. they go, oh, are you in a high risk uh, category? That's the first well, have question. Have you had sex with yeah. another man? And yeah. I'm like, uh, what does yeah. that have to do with right. this now disease? Right. Right. Give a little bit of context about it, that. It drives you crazy. The, uh, there are five risk factors at the CDC level. And, of course, we all know the dirty, the, the can perceived dirty things that some people consider, and, and I don't. But that is, you know, men having sex with men. Uh, the intravenous drug users. These are two of the biggest yeah. risk factors. Fair enough. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, one of the five risk factors, Dave, is having sex with somebody that you don't know their sexual history and having it unprotected. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that many of us in this world can look at each other and say we haven't been down this road before. Mm -hmm. But it's it's so it's be it's like the 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 heavy ball in the room, the elephant in the room nobody wants to talk about and I get it, the privacy, the sexuality, all the, 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 but come on. We we're, we've become so awkward and politically correct to the point where we're watching people die. Mm -hmm. There are new changes with this disease uh, that people need to know about, and it's not a cure, uh, but it damn well impacts why we need to know about the virus. The only virus that's not dangerous is the one you don't know about. Oh, sure. That is the that's the here that's the rub. And it, it shouldn't be about, well, please tell me what kind of risk factors you're in before I determine whether or not you're going to be able to have an HIV test. Mm. Let me put you on the spot before we even begin. Yeah, uh, th There shouldn't be risk factors yeah. to it. I get that there are, but the reality is we could get rid of the stigma if we get rid of the risk factor nonsense. Yeah. And just be able to say, hey, look, if you're going to take my blood and test my cholesterol and 50 other things, you could test me for a communicable disease that I could be accidentally giving. I want to take responsibility yep. for, for my health and what I put out to the world. So Now, that's fascinating because I follow you on Facebook, and you had pictures of a trip to Washington, D.C. It shows you going into legislative spaces, and it shows you in the state of Arizona doing legislative. Yeah. Tell me about that journey. Yeah, the, the last uh, it began in Washington D.C. Uh, during my last trip called the, uh, the Talks in the Park series, I traveled to 23 different states. Got in my car and drove uh, across the country wow. from Arizona to Vermont. I did 13 different talking events, and it was right in the middle of the summer during this healthcare craziness, oh, where sure. you know these millions of people were about to be hung out to dry and. 
I am not political. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. I think it's the biggest bunch of nonsense out there, the Republican, Democrat silliness. Yep. And that whole game of, of dividing people, yep. it's, it just drives you crazy. But it was it, it became a scary time for a lot of people that that wasn't that the bill was going to pass. It's that we had a government that actually served that up mm -hmm. and for a win said, we're going to hang millions out to dry. Yep. And what we did as a people in response to it, it was baffling. So I literally, at the end of my journey, got in my car and on the way back to Arizona, decided to, to drive through Washington, D.C. And I was in a pretty bad medical space. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, I was, I've been really sick on the trip and a lot of things in the, in the new book that I talk about, about my story that uh, will, will scare the heck out of most people. And I, was less than honest about a lot of it because I didn't want people scared. And how you doing, Robert? No, oh, I'm, I'm fine. hanging on like a hair in a biscuit. But <laughs> you know, it, it you know, I, it, that's just not the way I work. It's how are you? Hey, great. Every day is even better. It's, it, I'm amazing. It's probably some people are like, God, he's, he's so positive. He's an asshole sometimes. But. <laughs> He's an inspiration. To I us tell all. you, you know, people. How do you do it? Well, I have a quarter of your immune system. Yeah. That's how I do it, and why I do it. I have to do it. Just do it. You have to be able to find some humor in the things that yeah. come up. I mean, every day I sit and and have to weigh: Do I go to an emergency room today, or do I not go to an emergency room? Mm -hmm. it's, it's craziness. So you you try to find any humor where you can with it all, but. So yeah, we I drove right into Washington D.C. DC without a plan, uh, two days before the health care vote. Wow! Um, I walked right into the state house. Didn't know you could. Wow! Um, I could barely walk down these huge marble halls. I could barely get up the stairs, and I started walking into one senator's office after another. And uh, what I saw, I was appalled by. There were. Right in the middle of this healthcare vote, so there were people coming out of the woodwork begging. I mean, there were old people in walkers mm. and veterans in wheelchairs being wheeled in, and they were begging. Oh, Dave and I just walked around that Capitol for the day. I visited twenty senators' offices, and in a few senators' offices, I was literally left speechless mm. to just sit and watch. Mm. I watched demonstrators pour into one and start ranting and raving, and I just sat there looking at this powerful expression of human need. And uh, but everywhere I went, they were quick to try to rush me right out the back door. Mm -hmm. and what was the con? Uh, what did you say? To, Hi. Why um, can't we? We we now know, medically speaking, that if you're taking HIV medications that it will lower the virus in your blood system to a degree where it is medically impossible to spread the disease. Mm -hmm. Some might, you know, it's humongous. Yeah. You literally can stop the spread of the disease yeah. for the first time in its history. Yeah. Now that is the most impactful thing yeah. about your work. Yeah. People need to know that. The, if you fell asleep, are like, what? if you were just zoning out, you need to let people know that one more yeah. time. Yeah. And, and the irony is that... No, say it one more time. Tell people that. <laughs> if you are on viral medication with HIV, you suppress your viral load, it is virtually impossible to spread the disease medically. And that's all yeah. in the last year this has yeah. come out that we've been able to say medically we now know. If, as an example, I'm on these medications. They, they don't just keep me alive. Everybody's like, hey, that's great. It's a, to me, it's a responsibility. I, I still have protected sex, unlike what I did before. Um, but the reality still is it's impossible to spread the disease. So again, that only disease that we are scared of is the one we don't know about. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and we just want it to be a routine thing. The CDC recommends every year every human being be tested. Mm -hmm. Seems pretty simple. Yep. Um, and that's every, every age group. And, mm -hmm. you know, we... We still have the majority of the advocation for, for this disease is still being done by the, the gay transgender population. Mm -hmm. And although the numbers are higher in that social, the social realm, <laughs> this is a disease for everybody. Talk about a oneness. Yep. 
that if, if you really yeah. want to make positive social changes, you've got to collaborate yeah. and, and help us all that we need to find some forgiveness for 35 years of just turning our back mm -hmm. saying, it's not my problem. Yep, not well, my problem. It is our problem. Yeah. And then you compound that with uh, a belief system that says, well, this is some sort of religious judgment. Right. This is God judging you because. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, those were things that I was literally taught yeah. as a, a young person yeah. in the 80s. Yeah. There was like, you know, in the Bible it said they'll yeah. receive in themselves the recompense for their oh, sin. Yeah. And I was like, really? Is and, that what it meant? And, it was written 2,000 years ago. It was talking about 1985. Unbelievable. Yeah. And, and in traveling around about. the world. I talk about that, yeah. and and I've offended people by oh, talking no. about you it. You offended people, <laughs> you know. This this why can't we talk about it? And, yeah. and uh, it, it, it's almost unbearable that we are legitimately watching a disease continue to spiral out of control after this yeah. long, because it's awkward. Yeah, uh, get over it. It's time. You know, it's now attacking our daughters. Uh, by the time your knees hit the floor today, 400 children, 400 babies will be diagnosed with HIV. Wow. We can't, you test my cholesterol every time you're in my blood, but yep. you can't test me for a communicable disease that I may have infected 20 people with. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Because that, it's awkward? I don't think so. That, uh, after having met you and ha having heard this conversation, it's brought awareness to my family. I have college age kids and we have a conversation and yeah. then they're like, yeah, we have peers yeah. that have, uh, that are HIV positive yeah. and now have AIDS yeah. that are, you know, having now to deal yeah. with this. Yeah. And the good news is it's not necessarily a death sentence right. at this point. Now there's the ability to still have a yeah. life, but it, there's a cost with it. Yeah. Yeah. You, I mean, they'll tell you it's as, if it's caught early enough, you can have a, a fairly routine, normal life with a mm -hmm. chronic disease that will, will have issues and will need to be addressed and monitored, but your life expectancy could be absolutely normal. Mm. Um, getting caught late, that's a different ball of wax yeah. you, you can't buy back burnt building. Mm. Um, so once it's ravaged you and this whole, you know, my ego was way too big to ever walk in and say, boy, I think I probably need an HIV test. Mm -hmm. It just, there's no way I would have ever done it. I was a big time executive, hundred miles an hour with my hair on fire. And, and, and yeah, I get, we can go get tested, but you're not going to find the majority of people walking into one of these HIV free clinics saying, mm -hmm. Hey, I'm here for a test today. Yeah. It just isn't going to happen. So there are clinics oh, where yeah. people can get tested free, and it there's no cost to it because there's free. people and organizations yep. that have made it available. Right. But still, they're like, oh, where are you going? And like, you don't want to yeah. tell them. Um, oh, no. You know, no, no. It's this that negative stigma Oh, my gosh. They'll put sunglasses and hats yeah. and just that whole awkward stage of, I mean, I remember being a teenager buying condoms. Do you remember that? The, the feeling of... Oh, it was sneaky, yeah. You, know. you, you don't want to get caught. Yeah. Just, my gosh, yeah. this has been to the point where you the watch, beginning of time here. You watch the funny movie in the right. 80s where the kid's like, oh, you know. You know. Okay, it's, okay. <laughs> it's, it's okay not to be cool all the time. <laughs> you know, it's... Um, I worry about the kids today. They're, they're dealing with a lot of different things and uh, a lot of different stresses and you know, the, the whole success of our story, the book, the upcoming movie, the, everything that was all about just paying attention to who comes along in, in yeah. life and, and how you can reward each other for that encounter yeah. and taking responsibility for each encounter with another human being. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and putting everything you got into it. Yeah. You know, what's fascinating is the proceeds from your book, uh, the first one, 20 seconds, a great success, but a, most of the proceeds are going into your charity. Talk, talk about yeah. the Give a Buck charity. Yeah, well, we started Give a Buck with the idea, the crazy, holy cow idea of it shouldn't take a ton from everybody. Yeah. It actually really as a collaborative experience in history. It took a little bit from a lot of different people, not a lot of it from a small number yep. of people. It's not to, give to, a million. Right. It's, it's give a buck. <laughs> give a buck. So we thought, who, who doesn't have a dollar? Yeah. If I walk up to you and say, hey, Dave, can I borrow a dollar? Yeah. It, it, here's a dollar. Yeah. What if every human being donated one dollar 
with the understanding that they understood the, the new information that's out there, that the disease can be stopped, that we need to get it tested, that, that risk factors really are probably crap, and that it's now affecting children, babies, even their senior citizens, mm -hmm. and having that conversation and, and committing that one dollar, seven billion people. Imagine that. Yeah. I, mean, I know it sounds insane, yeah. but if you literally made it that simple because we love easy mm -hmm. don't we i mean <laughs> we love america easy. <laughs> but it's almost gotten too easy yeah you know so most people read through the book and put it down and it's exhausting mm. it's exhausting mm -hmm. the book is you're laughing on on page 19 and you're crying on page 22 yeah. and and i think that was the the beauty behind the book was i, I don't even remember writing most of it it was just bleeding onto those mm -hmm. pages and letting that story go there are this sometimes even today six years later i look back and think how did i even survive all that i mean that's a story that needs to be told yeah. and i try not to say this is how i survived it this is what you need to do i just don't believe in that yeah. but i do tell the story with great emotion yeah. and and i let people decide for themselves but i'm absolutely certain it's moments like this even that are our healing moments or that you're exchanging ideas and, and and love and feelings with another human being and you're better for it i'm better for it and and understanding the responsibility that goes with it yeah. and the hundreds of people thousands yeah. who will see this and yeah. maybe find one glitter speckle of hope yeah. that anything really is possible yeah. I mean, you can survive without an immune system. People are dying from things I've survived every day with a fully functioning immune system. It's just not an option. Mm. So you find ways mm -hmm. to find that gratitude and that happiness and positivity every day. And for me, when things get rough and, and crazy stuff happens and you get down in the world, it became a, a habitual thing for me that if I get stressed, I went and found something to do for somebody else. Yeah, it was usually volunteering. Yep, and it started when I was in hospice. Yep, it wasn't a I'm going to get up today and go work the Special Olympics. It was like I couldn't stop in hospice, volunteering, and I think it's a profound part of my survival. Yeah, is there's something about that act of service where right. you're giving back. You're no longer focusing on your internal pity. Poor me. Yeah. You're like, wow, I yeah. am, I get to be of service. Yeah. And there's almost that little. You get the juice, man. And you get the, the rush. joy and the yeah. the all the adrenalines and the and all the neurotoxins that are released from. But man, maybe it's just that simple. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So people go to the website and they can literally PayPal or yeah. credit or they whatever. They can donate their gab or uh, mm -hmm. we've even started because a lot of people just, they won't even give the dollar ironically. Mm -hmm. So we, we started selling tie dyes that we hand make and uh, we sell crystals at wholesale prices. So there's always a way to, to get involved with gab. Um, so, so now it's going to be, yeah, see, the, these incredible crystals yeah, are amazing. I have a lot of fun with those. And you can get one on Robert's site. Uh, tell us the name of the site before I forget about it. It's Crystals for Life on Facebook. Um, and it directs right from our website at 20seconds.net yep. or tremorbooks.com. Yep. Um, and then, of course, the main charity website is Gab Inc. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's gab, uh, gabinc.org. So that's been up and running now, and we're off and hauling we just uh, published uh, our first non-book that's not in mine yeah oh now i'm um, so excited about it uh, yeah so you decided so hey i'm an author but there's something i feel it needs to be changed in this industry yeah i want to do something different so you I, actually started your own publishing i, I think it was literally the day i became a bestseller mm -hmm. that i said it was literally almost a year to the date and i just said Tremor Books owned the copyright to the book anyway, and I said, this process of finding your voice should be easier. It should be more supportive. It shouldn't be as expensive as it is, these indie publishers and all these crazy publishing arms popping up all over the place. So, you know, it became uh, everybody could publish a book, and, and publishing a book's great. Anybody can now. Yeah. I mean, you can, your 12 year old can get you a Create Space account and get your book on Amazon. Yeah. Selling a book, is another ball of wax. Yep. Um, so it literally took 
time. But literally when a year hit and we hit bestseller, I said, I, I want to do this for somebody else to, to teach them what I had to learn on our own from these publishers who are very unsupportive, taking 75% of my, uh, of my royalties. That's the normal procedure. Wow. I think most people think that the author gets the majority. Oh of my God. Money. If you click on my ebook tomorrow, mm -hmm. um, I, I make a dollar 75. Wow. Yeah. So as a publisher, you know, the publisher makes 75% of the royalties mm -hmm. after Amazon and everything else. Because so Amazon's going to get their The account. author makes 25%. So we thought Tremor Books, what if we reversed it? So we pay the author 75%. Tremor Books takes 25%. And we indie publish it for very inexpensive, if, if at any cost at all. But I teach the whole process. Mm -hmm. And then the next author will teach the next one. Yeah. And so all of us is a collaborative source of authors who've been there are basically just sending the elevator back down and trying to help somebody back up. That is so good. Uh, we just think it should be easier to find mm -hmm. your voice and, and yeah. the magic that it's it's brought for me and, and uh, millions now. It's just amazing to me some days to wake up and know that somebody in Indonesia closed the cover of my book with a tear in their eye and said, I can do this. Mm -hmm. Do you know? Yeah. It's just... It's just Naked forever, I guess. That's weird. <laughs> I love that. So what I really like about your story is you said you started to tune into synchronicities mm. and you became very sensitive. Yeah. Yeah, I still am. It's um, I'm not exactly sure I have a full handle on how energy affects us. Uh, there's obviously a lot of good data and research out there now. Because you I were got, never a woo-woo guy. No, right? no. Yeah. But I mean, I was getting these data dumps, you know, and I still get them daily of these holy cow ideas mm -hmm. of, you know, things that, you know, who cares? Uh, no offense. I'm sure they're important. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know, you're like, man, I don't really want to know how to calculate some equation that will serve me no functional purpose, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, it, it was a constant data dump of different things. And, just, you know, you'd be sitting there just talking to somebody. All of a sudden, you'd laugh out loud because you'd just get hit with these holy cow yeah. things. And wow, that's great. So I used to spend, I spent the first couple of years, I'd, I'd like go out and research these holy cow ideas and... I think some of it out of fear of, you know, holy, I don't know if I'm not the first guy to think of this, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to be the first idiot to say, hey, this is possible. <laughs> um, surely MDs and PhDs do that, not, yeah. not little authors like me. So, uh, uh, But synchronicities, you know, I, I talk about our intuition and we've done a lot of, of good research on, on synchronicities and how that is our connection with with people past mm -hmm. and uh, i think every time i experience a deja vu or a synchronistic moment it's there's no coincidences it's i pay attention to everything yeah. that, that happens to me now and uh, uh, but you can't act on everything mm -hmm. so you have to do have to pay attention to when it comes up so when it comes up three times that's usually when i act on Start to feel so that. i have to yeah. Yeah, it'll drive me crazy if i don't so. so there was an incredible story uh this last year mm. uh there was a family up in yeah. the woods in pace in arizona and yeah. uh, a torrential flood just uh, a, a big rainstorm yeah. came created a flood and killed many members of that family yeah and that was in the news. Yeah. And you had some profound experience associated with that. Yeah. It, um, I, well, Carol and I happened to be on the mountain that day. It was the very day I got back from this huge trip across the country. I uh, Honestly, we wondered if I'd make it back. Mm. So getting back to Arizona, I had poured into Carol's arms and we spent the weekend on the mountain in Payson. Wow. And uh, we watched this particular storm come in. And we had been at the swimming holes. And and uh, so it was just this ominous doom came over Carol and I. And we felt like we had to get out of the woods as mm. this storm approached. And we did. Uh, and it was a horrendous downpour. And mm -hmm. uh, lo and behold, right at the bottom of the mountain that we were on, uh, 10 family members were mm. swept away. Um in a, in a mudslide and uh, all 10 were killed mm -hmm. and carol and i had you know paid attention to some energy we felt on the mountain and got the hell out of there and 
uh, I'm not sure if it was guilt or or what happened from there, but uh, we came home back to Mesa and uh, they started the search for all the bodies yeah. and, and slowly but surely found everyone but one. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was two days later and this back home in Mesa was driving me crazy that we maybe survivors remorse, maybe just the impact of my trip and my journey and being at the state house trying to get legislation passed and such a ton of emotions going on. I got in my car at three o'clock in the morning and drove back up to Payson to try to help with the search party. Wow. Three in the morning. Oh yeah. Just couldn't stop it. Yeah. Told Carol, she's go. And, and you just had that nagging oh, feeling. You need drives to drives me crazy. Yeah. And I, the psychic things have started since the near death experience and I run from them. I, I fight them. I don't like them. I don't <laughs> deal with them. I don't embrace them. I'm sorry. I'm sure I'm at fault. At some point I will have to. Um, but you know, I mean, it's hard enough coming out and telling a story like this without, you know, talking about those kind of things that all of us experience after these experiences. And, and that's an increase in psychic abilities. And you, you can deny it if you want. I spend my days doing it, mm -hmm. uh, but it's real. Yeah. So this was overpowering. I get in the car and I drove up and not even thinking I'd even be allowed in, right? I mean, you've got firemen and rescue workers all over the place on the mountain looking. Um, and sure enough, I pulled up to the first road stoppage and told this fireman in tears, I'm a near-death experiencer. I'm supposed to be here. I've been called here. I don't know what for. Um, I'm a former police officer, former army medic. Um, I'm not going anywhere and tell me where to go. And well, we don't, we're not accepting volunteers, yeah. but he let me through. Incredible. So I went up to the next stop, told the next guy the same thing, just poured my heart out. And I don't do this. Yeah. I just, I'm here for a reason. I don't know what it is. He let me through to the next stop. So I finally get up to the final place where all the firemen coordinate from and are searching the river and woods. And this was, you know, four days into it. They still haven't found this one father. Mm. Um, and he had last been seen grabbing one of his babies. Oh. And you just knew he was a fighter. You knew, right? And it was driving me crazy. I was getting all these psychic things and I fighting and wrestling with it. Are you it, seeing but, the images of it? Oh yeah. There, I kept getting sunflowers and I kept getting different pictures and guts. My insides were going crazy. And here I am surrounded by all these firefighters and cops. And one, only one civilian, me. And I walk up to the river and I'm shaking. People just probably thought it's a crazy guy. Just, just yeah. let him do whatever. <laughs> and lo and behold, the family of this, of this person we're looking for climbs out of the trees mm. and we all hug and I tell them the same story. I'm a near death experiencer. I have no idea what I'm doing here, but I'm here to support you and do whatever to, we're going to find him. So I spent the day with the family. The fire department didn't want us in the woods anymore mm -hmm. and demanded that we stay out. And Yeah, I heard that the family came up there to yeah, help. They and were they out, said, well, we're going to suspend yeah, it for now. That was the family it. says, well, we're still looking. Right. They were tenacious. And they made the family stay out of the woods, which is hard for the family. Mm. So I stayed with the family. Oh, and incredible. Talked about my survival, my story for hours, just sitting there sharing what my experience with is with dying and death and just an amazing piece to have yeah. time. I imagine you were able to at least share some. Oh, they were, we had such an emotional yeah. experience. And wow. uh, so one of them finally said, can you bring me down to get our car? And so, yes, so I drove them down. And she, the minute we drove down to this place, I dropped him off. I got out of the car and there's this giant sunflower in the middle of the mountain, just overlooking this valley. And it was way far from where they were searching. And, I literally pulled over my car, got out of the car, walked into the woods and started following the river. And I started following butterflies. Wow. I'm crying walking down this riverbank, mud and debris everywhere. And I'm following this butterfly yeah. and this guy. And I know this is where I'm supposed to be. And lo and behold, I see a search dog hundred yards down the last search party down this far down dog bounds for me. I'm so emotionally exhausted. I collapse and the dog lays in my lap Wow! while the firemen are looking at me going, what the hell? Who is this guy? What are you doing here? 
And I tell them the same story. I'm like, oh, experience there. I, mean, I don't know what I'm doing here, but I can't. I, this part of the river was drawing me. And they said, well, the dog too. We can't get him out of the river. I said, he's here. He's right here. But he's under and it's going to need to get moved around. And there's rain coming and that's what's going to do it. And I was exa- I was like, I didn't even know what I was saying. Yeah. And they said, we're listening. And they've never even seen a dog lay with, you know, this big, huge search dog. He's laying on my lap crying. Was there rain in the forecast that day? No, no. They actually said, oh, no, we've got weather people with the service, forest service. We're good. And so I walked out of the forest and they, uh, the fire chief and everybody, hey, you shouldn't have been in there. But we heard about the dog. What the hell happened? And I said, this is why I was drawn here. You need to move your search down here. He's down here. And they did. Um, about an hour later, though, they got the notice that a rainstorm had cropped over the edge of the oh, thing. Wow. So yeah. they emptied the woods and were staring at me, you know, over in the corner under the sycamore tree, wondering how I knew about the rain. Mm. And I didn't really know. But uh, uh, anyway, they all came out of the woods and probably all thought I was strange. And uh, so, Well, you are. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm totally good with that. And, <laughs> That's right. Uh, the family moved on that day, went back to and waited and uh, reassured that we'd find him. And then uh, uh, that was it. I got in my car and drove home. And they found they found his body a few hours after they resumed searches mm. and moved the search. Yep. And, so he was uh, in that exact spot where you yeah, were hanging out. Yeah. Just up in the woods somewhere? Well, they, their search parties were so far up north that yeah they didn't expect he would be way down there wow just, they were like out of the range i could just see him fighting you know wow. over that debris to see a mudslide is just it's unbelievable oh, that's incredible. i don't even know how anybody would survive it but yeah to have a family lose 10 people like that so i was very privileged to get involved with that and i hidden from it ran, mm-hmm. ran from it a little bit i Got contacted by Telemundo and some news agencies and did mm. some interviews, but I I just mm-hmm. didn't want to go public with it. I didn't, you know, I don't, I don't want to look for people for a living. It, mm-hmm. it I mean, I slept for two days after that. Oh my! I bet there was such I, an energy drain. I was out of my mind. With I couldn't stop. Mm-hmm. I, there was nothing you were going to do to stop me from mm-hmm. going and and doing what I needed to do and. Even the damn dog, where they, you know, this dog was just yeah, and that's uncharacteristic for that dog, type of a trained big, animal. Huge search dog, and he's like laying in my yeah. lap, soaking wet, and we're crying. Yeah, I'm bawling my eyes out on the riverbank, and you know, just a grown man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that so, is incredible. But the irony was, while we were sitting there with that dog, and uh, they're like, "What's going on?" and they were talking to me. Uh, one of them said, "Ho, oh, oh, ho!" and looked down. They had, they found his cell phone. Oh, they found wow. the husband's cell phone right there while we were sitting. There. Wow! So that was another reason why they ended up listening to me and, and moving the surge. Mm-hmm. So great, you know. But I I still run from it a little bit, mm-hmm. and, and uh, it's not going to be something I'm going to be writing. You know, when can I attack the next right. case and yeah. solve <laughs> new business? It just venture. was, <laughs> you know, it was overpowering. It was overwhelming, mm-hmm. and, and a lot of things in my experiences since my yeah. near death experience have been that way. Mm-hmm. And uh, try not to get scared with it. You just kind of go with yeah. it, and 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 know that things are happening for a reason if you're paying attention. Yeah, for sure. Now, last week on the show, we had Jeff Olson on, mm-hmm. and he shared that you and him are going to be speaking in Sedona in February. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so this is a 2018 event. If you're listening to this episode years down the road, well, it happened in 2018. But uh, for those of you that are uh, live and in tune, um, this event is coming in the middle of February? February 9th, 9th to 11th. Yeah. Yeah. In, in the heart of the crystal vortexes in Sedona. So, I mean, it's wow. Mm, you, incredible. If you if people haven't been to Sedona, it's, I mean, holy cow. It's, it's hard to even explain it. But... And then we're going to put 12 speakers in, in for two days telling these raw, transformative stories of hope that are 
I mean, these aren't like, you know, I tripped on a banana peel. These are like, <laughs> holy cow, I got kidnapped, woke up in Argentina. And, you know, I mean, yeah. like, what? Yeah, he shared some incredible stories what of people. What the heck, yeah. right? These Stuffed are in a duffel bag and woke up in a shot different country. for yeah. dead. Yeah. What the heck are you talking yeah. about? I Somebody mean, that actually has yeah. lived with end-stage AIDS for six years and is some a crazy death. guy. Yeah. <laughs> in your death Keeps shirt. surviving without an immune system. <laughs> Who knows? This wacky guy. Right. So at that event, uh, people are going to sign up. They're going to have the opportunity to hear stories. Yeah. Um, I, I know that that type of a thing takes a lot of planning. It takes a lot of preparation. Uh, what do you think that message is for that conference? What do you think people are going to take away? Oneness. Yeah. I mean, ironically, the, the company uh, supporting it is called At One. At One. Um, so, I mean, it, it's just everything to me now. Is yep. uh, I, If I'm talking in Istanbul, Turkey, or, or Portland, Maine, um, or anywhere in between, my entire conversation is about oneness. Yeah. And, it's good. And our connectivity and our responsibility for it. Yep. And the massive power of it. It... Uh, it's a little humbling mm -hmm. if you really want to get truthful with it. I think we all need to start getting there. And who knows, according to the world, 54% of us have woken up in some manner or yep. another. And it's at these events like this where you get together with like-minded people. It's so Holy good. Cow. Because you find yeah. you find a community, people yeah. that they're like, Yeah, we yeah. we feel this way. And yeah. you're like, hey, I identify yeah. with that. Oh, it'll change your whole vibration for yeah. weeks. That website is at one now. Uh, if you're listening to it on a podcast, yeah. at one now.com. And uh, that's gonna be an incredible event. Yeah. Um, do you feel like uh, there's a shift in consciousness happening because I think the near-death experience story is yeah. becoming a more common story. Yeah, it's something that you know when Dr. Raymond Moody first published a book in yeah. 1975 called Life After Life, it was like people are like, "What are you yeah. talking about? Yeah. Heresy! It's of the devil!" Right. And you know, but there's been so many stories. Yeah, and now that yourself, you've had an experience. Yeah. How do you think consciousness is shifting forward? I, little by little, mm. and I think it's always, obviously, always done that. But there has been a rapid acceleration mm -hmm. of, of the spiritual-minded people, and I don't know if it started in the '70s with the, the you know the, the love revolution or whatever. There are probably a million things that are happening, but people are waking up at such a rapid speed, mm -hmm. and and then you look in the world and see how it's faring mm -hmm. and you wonder the correlation yeah um, it's not accidental it's absolutely necessity and and we'll we'll work our way out of it we always do um, but you know like the example of a near-death experience maybe the real truth and and the real hard part of life is will we ever actually learn something until we experience it mm, that's good and 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 we need to be okay in forgiving ourselves for it. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about it either. You, you can't take for granted that seed that you do plant with somebody. But for me, after my experience, I thought I was going crazy. So for me, finding community of like-minded people who experienced the same thing was everything. Mm -hmm. And that's not, again, an accident. It, it all seems to always seems to come back to the same thing, mm -hmm. is, is that we are all interwoven and connected to, in some degree, manner or another. Um, and we're all affecting each other just by our mere presence, our, our tones, our energies, our, what we say, how we feel. Um, and this world is, is in a damn bit of hurry to, to maybe avoid feeling, you know. So you get, a, you get a, a couple hundred people in a room and start dumping emotion. Yeah. Forget it. Yeah. I mean, that's where anything's possible. Yeah. So your books can be found at Tremor, is it tremorbooks.com? Yeah. You can, uh, you obviously can purchase the books anywhere. Amazon, yeah. Barnes and Nobles, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, the new book will be released at the end of, uh, well, be Christmas time, uh, Dying for Forgiveness. And this is the one that's, this is the one that's worrying me a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I spared no I spared nothing in this mm, book. Pretty vulnerable. Yeah, and it's and it isn't the blow sunshine at you the entire time. We get into the real truths about yep. 
not only living with the disease, but advocating for the disease. And uh, that, that pesky topic that I've struggled with since my illness, which is how we deal with people who are ill and dying. Mm -hmm. It's an awkward topic. And to be completely candid about it, we all pretty much suck at it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's okay. Especially in this Western culture. Yeah. I mean, people in the East, they'll honor death and they yeah. view it as just a passing. And it's, totally right. it's just movement forward. You're so and right. They believe in the cyclical oh, yeah. karmic life of yeah. reincarnation. But yeah. in the West, we're like, no, it's one and done. And then the judgment. And it's a we whole, get stuck in that whole thing. It's a what's in it for me or what's and then they what am I losing out of yep. this deal? And Nobody the wants to begins. talk about it because there's this great fear surrounded about it. So I think, you know, that's a natural transition of, but you know, one thing I talked about in my book that was the hardest thing for me, I was kind of, I was a selfish guy as a young man. Mm. It was career and speed and making money and chasing girls mm. and not necessarily in that order. Those were my priorities. And, and today it's making an impact that I'll be remembered for yep. and trying to help as many as I can, as long as I can. Yep. Um, but, but you know, it, will we ever really get it until it happens mm -hmm. to us? And I, the irony is, is thick, yep. frankly, but at some point you hope, you know, with all these stories that keep coming out, these miracles that keep happening, that at some point when they're happening like a million times, that we're not going to call them miracles anymore. Mm. You know what it's I mean? Good, it's, yeah. it's, it's the normal range of how things go. Yeah. And we know we can heal ourselves from almost the most impossible thing in the world. Mm. There are examples of them, mm. and they're coming up. And to be honest, some people like me who are surviving things they're not supposed to, we can kind of piss off the world a little bit. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I get it. Yeah. I get it. I, I see people... You know, I'm complaining about the bunion on my foot for six, you know, and this guy's, this guy's had 10 rectal cancer surgeries mm. in the last three years and still gets up and has a joke for mm. everybody. And sure, I'm hiding from a lot of pain and it's yep. a daily thing for me, but you can go crawl in a corner and, and slink away, but you know. I've never been the guy that old soldiers never die. They just fade away guy. I, nice. I think I've been more the deaf leopard. I'd rather burn out than fade away. Yeah. Guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, tell someone who feels like they're not in any risk category whatsoever, why they should go get tested for HIV. Simply because they don't think they're in the risk factor. Yeah. We can rationalize a gazillion ways to get away from not having to get tested. But after 36 years, I guess I'm wondering, maybe it's time we do something different yep. and expect different results. So for the people who say, but I'm not in a risk factor, I say get tested twice. Yeah, that's good. Do you know what I mean? Because that's it good. isn't, you know, it just needs, we just need to be okay with the test, mm -hmm. not, not the, the crap that's gone with the test. So yeah, it, it, you don't have to be in a risk factor. That's the real issue. Uh, but just like the next book that was hard for me to write, Dying for Forgiveness, the one thing I did not talk about in 20 seconds was being diagnosed with end-stage AIDS. There was one unequivocal thing that ran through my mind other than, but I'm not gay. It was, who have I hurt? Oh, incredible. Who have I hurt? Yeah. And it's real, and we need to be okay talking about that too. Yeah. And it's a painful part of the next book is, if I had just taken responsibility and I need to be okay and forgiving myself for it, but by not getting tested, you are legitimately putting other people at risk mm. and, and yourself included. Yeah. And uh, we can do better yeah. uh, at least having an honest conversation that it isn't a, a gay disease. Yeah. Um, it's not a dirty, ridiculous. This is a disease that I think started with, there was nothing anybody could do. And that had to have had an impact. I talked with a lot of doctors who said in the 80s, we watched people die mm. and there was nothing we could do. Mm. Imagine it. Incredible. The conditioning that goes with that. Today, we can do something about it. And you can see the joy in their eyes. But at some point, I think a lot of the world went, oh, well, you know, there's medication for those diseases mm. now. I've even had some people, I thought we cured that. Wow. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, there's still a lot of mm -hmm. maybe willful ignorance about the disease. Hmm. 
Um, and, and it kind of became that party joke that really should have never been a party joke. No. Of, uh, do careful, you'll get AIDS. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not a, it's, it, it has stayed around. It, it has now evolved mm -hmm. almost like it listened to us. Yep. And I don't think that's accidental. Yeah. So we can continue to let one segment of the population tow it up the hill like we have been. Uh, or we can all take individual responsibilities for it. And, and if you don't think you're in the risk factor, yep. that's when you go get tested. Yep. Be an example. Yep. Show people this is what needs to be done. You can literally end a disease that's killed yep. 36 million people. Yep. That's bigger than any Holocaust in the history of, of genocide. Yep. You're 36 million people are dead. <sighs> wow. And it, there's, it doesn't even have to be a courageous Census. act. To, to go get a test. It doesn't have to be like, look at me, oh, look how great it is. And in fact, if it were to become a little bit more nonchalant, hey, what'd you do today? Oh, yeah. I went and got an AIDS test just to make sure, oh, yeah. well, good for you, you know, yeah. high five. And it feels like it doesn't have yeah. to be like, really? Do you think you're in a right. risk category? No, I think we're all in a risk category. Right. You know, I just think it's a, a thing that we could bring into public consciousness. See, yeah. the, when the risk factor gets removed, the stigma goes away. Yeah. Just just be real about the fact that, that this is out there and it's not getting fixed. It's 36 yeah. years we can do differently. Yeah. We have to do differently. Yeah. This new law could change aspects of everything. Yeah. And it, it just is, is very simple. It's not a mandate. It's not a... Nazi Germany, we're going to force you down and take your blood. It is that if if you are damn well in my veins taking my blood, I'm going to damn well take responsibility mm. for having the option of saying, while you're there, while you're there, just give it a run through, would yeah. you? Give me a once over, would you? Not? <laughs> and no, we don't Make need sure. to talk about why. Yeah, just get it done. Yeah, just get it handled. Yeah, and let's move on with our day. That's so good. And shake hands and be friends. Yeah, or I can sit and tell you the torrid details of my sex life, yeah. and we can get to the same results. But that's the whole silliness it's that needs to stop absolutely after thirty six years. Let, yeah. let's stop it. We yeah. we all know how it happens. Let, let's you know let's move on with just the fact of the matter is. We now, for the first time in the history of a disease, can functionally stop it yeah. with conscious choice. It doesn't need a cure. You know, don't need a vaccine. You can literally stop it in mm. its tracks. Incredible. Yeah. So your 2018 is going to be exciting. You've yeah. got a lot of stuff to do. You've got yes. a book. You've got a publishing company. You're going to do speaking engagements. You've got all sorts of things that you're doing. Um, reach out. Find Robert online. He's got a wonderful... Facebook presence. There are many inspirational things. Yeah. I'll sit and scroll through something and something inspirational pop up. I'm like, damn it, that guy did it again. I man. probably give too much free content, but some days you just get in that flow and you let things go. And yeah. man, we're missing real people. Yeah. You it's know, good. I, I and, want I and your want transparency real. and your vulnerability. People appreciate that. You know, is you, you don't sugarcoat it. No. You're just like, hey, this is who no. I am. I'm I've got, you know ugly spots and warts, but you get to see all of it along with the beauty and the goodness. Yeah. You know, we even with our book, and, and I've always found this quote relative for, for my life, is Jimmy V, you know, if you laugh, if you cry, and if you think in one day, that's a hell of a day. Yeah. And uh, it's Good. it's been the aspect of, of my, not just survival, but my my thriving. I, I don't just survive. I, I, I'm not just going to hang out on the couch. I'm going to do something with my time, whatever it may be. I I'm still have a disease. I still have a terminal disease yeah. because it was caught late. Yeah. And in the interim, until it catches me finally, I'll tell as many people as I can, as often as I can, that they can be different yeah. and that anything is possible. Yeah. Uh, even by and through my survival, if it's just giving somebody some hope. Uh, but rest assured, it, every day gives me hope. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Uh, I like to end the show with the guest telling us if there's one thing you took away from the show today, what would that be? Now, I kind of already think we covered a lot of that, but give us just that, that peaceful consciousness that if this is the one thing you take away from the show, it is this. <sighs> I hate to oversimplify things. 
and, and, and maybe this is too easy for people. I'm often quoted as saying, nothing great in life comes easy. And I think about that with my give a buck and just a dollar. Give me a dollar, right? It's so easy. And it's not doing well, maybe because it's too easy. You know, if there's one thing about this interview and the number of things that I do in, in public world and telling my story, it's not supposed to be easy. And you shouldn't fear the, the, the knowing it's not going to be easy. I, I don't consider our mistakes or our challenges anything other than our classrooms. It is in those moments that we are branded, we are forged in fire and polished to perfection. So, my Lord, let your freak flag fly. Tell your story with great emotion. And if there's one thing that I pull out of my experience has always been, try not to take a position, take an interest. It's just too hard to evolve defending a position. But if you take an interest in something, like how the whole world's snapping all around you. And the question is, will you be bold enough to grab it? <sighs> Robert Tremblay in the house. <laughs> Thanks for being yeah, part of the show, man. It was great. And uh, thanks for raising consciousness. Go out, give a buck, you can do it. Please. I'm David Marsh and you've been watching Exploring the Human Journey on YouTube as a video and listening as a podcast. If you would like to help continue the conversation, please consider supporting us by visiting patreon.com where you can support us on a monthly basis and get extra bonus content. For as little as a dollar a month, you can make this show sustainable and help continue spiritual consciousness. You can also help by following us on Facebook and Instagram. For more information about the show, find us online at exploringthehumanjourney.com.